ever play that little game? Wouldn't it have been cool to have been whoever? But with Bible characters, you know, wouldn't it have been cool to have been Samson, strongest man on earth? You know, except for that whole getting his eyes poked out, <laughs> dying as a prisoner, not that part, but or maybe wouldn't it have been cool to have been Noah? Get to spend all that time with those animals cooped up in a big boat for a year. Or what about Moses? Wouldn't it have been cool to have been Moses? To speak to God face to face. To uh, be God's hands to, to part the Red Sea strike Egypt with all those plagues, to deliver God's law to his people. Wouldn't that have been cool? I want you to think for a minute about a book like Deuteronomy. What do we have in Deuteronomy? Well, what we have is really a great big long sermon of Moses's. One of the most influential sermons, one of the most influential books ever written. So imagine if your sermon or book inspired generations of prophets in a nation like Moses' Deuteronomy did. You know, Deuteronomy was the textbook of the great prophets of Israel. How cool to be so influential for good among God's people. Imagine if something you said or wrote or spoke was required reading for a large group of people, a nation in fact, on a regular cycle. Wouldn't that be something? Uh, wouldn't that be cool? Why don't you look at Deuteronomy chapter 31 for a minute. I'm just going to start with a few verses there, beginning at verse 9. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 9. Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land that you're going over the Jordan to possess. So every seven years, the priests are to read this book to the people, right? That's I guess the ancient equivalent of a bestseller, you know. It's something that is to be read for generations. Wasn't Moses' life cool? Especially for a preacher, a writer. And so Moses goes on from there in chapter 31, and he appoints his successor, which is Joshua, to lead the people after him. God endorses this choice. Uh, Moses has prepared the nation for a new land. He has preached an incredibly influential sermon. It's been made into a published bestseller. You know, think about it. All he has left to do is retire in some villa beside the sea and enjoy all the fruits and enjoyments of his labors. Except 
that's not really how the story goes. Not the Bible story. Maybe that would be the um, made-for-TV Hallmark movie. Maybe uh, the Hollywood screenplay would uh, get all gussied up in that fashion, but not the Bible. Not real life. Not Moses' life. The Bible story instead goes like this. God says, Moses, can we have a word? Moses, you're going to die now. And Moses, I'm not going to let you retire in comfort. No rest for you. I'm, I'm not even going to let you set foot in this new land that you've prepared the people for. I'm going to bury you. No one, in fact, will know where I do it. There will be no memory stone that people can visit in future generations. There'll be no pilgrimage to your tomb, Moses. And that's how it ends. Well, that's not very cool. It's a, a, a bit of a bummer, really. But that's just one of the shoes that drops on Moses' head here at the end of his life. The other one, to me, would be much bigger and, and harder to endure. It's in verses 16 through 18 of the same chapter that we read from. I want you to notice, what does God say to Moses. I'm going to give you the Mason paraphrase of this, and much better uh, we have projected here the actual text. But here's what it says in essence God says to Moses, as soon as you're dead, these people are, are going to fall away from me and worship other gods. They can't wait. Moses, until you stop breathing so they can jump into bed with Baal. And I'm going to destroy them, Moses, and then maybe they'll learn. Well, that's the other shoe that drops. So God tells Moses, you know, here's what reality looks like. And God tells Moses that he isn't done writing yet. He wants him, in fact, to compose a song. If you look at the next passage, verses 19 and following, uh, of chapter 31, notice this instruction from the Lord to Moses. Now therefore, God says, write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. For when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers, and they have eaten and are full and are grown fat, they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise me and break my covenant. And when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song, shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. For I know what they are inclined to do even today, before I have brought them into the land that I swore to give. So Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the people of Israel. God asks Moses to write a song. And did you notice that it's supposed to be a children's song? Something that the kids would not forget? That one day they could sing it in rebuke to their parents, basically. Well, you can read the words of that song in the next chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 32. It's a sad song, really. We might call it blues. 
A song about, on the one hand, how good and mighty God is, but then, on the other, how sinful and weak his people were. And after he writes it, he recites it to the people and tells them, memorize this. And tells them, you're going to need this later. That's over in verse 44 of that chapter. And then in the next chapter, chapter 33, Moses pronounces blessings on all the tribes of Israel. And then in chapter 34, he climbs his final mountain and he dies there in that secret place overlooking the land that had been promised to the people. Now, I want you to think for a few minutes more today about how Moses dies. Maybe it wouldn't have been so cool to have been Moses after all. Moses dies of failure, you might say. By all human means of reckoning, he's a failure. And he knows it because God's just told him. He has preached and written and judged and prophesied all to no avail. The people, God says, are all going to leave the faith. All of Moses' leadership, all of his training and teaching, all his many years of intercession and prayer for, his, for this people will result in them becoming spiritual adulterers almost as soon as he takes his last breath. It's all going to fall apart. Everything he had worked so hard for, everything he had sacrificed for, he could have led his later years as a, sort of a life of leisure, as a prince down in Egypt. He had that choice. He gave that up for Israel. He could have been a shepherd until retirement in Midian. He did that for a long time. Hard work, no doubt, but honest and rewarding. He gave that up to shepherd a, a flock that would ultimately run away from him. How would you like to find out at the end of your life that all you had worked for was all going to fall to pieces? Ask a preacher that question who's devoted his life to a congregation. Ask an, an eldership who've given their best years to a local flock. Not very cool. It's actually a story that's not unique to Moses. In fact, it's pretty common in the Bible and among the people of God. Think about it for a minute. What did Jesus know about his closest followers as he neared his death on the cross? He knew that they would all fall apart and that they would all forsake him. They would scatter, wouldn't they? Think about Paul. How often did he pour his life and heart into a group of people only to hear later of all their problems and sins and their bickering and their divisions? Indeed, of some of them following falling clear away from the faith. Paul told a group of elders once, as he departed from them, he said, Indeed, after I leave, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, but from among your own selves will arise men speaking strange, twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. That's Acts chapter 20, if you want to see it. 
Then, for example, Revelation, second and third chapter of Revelation, Jesus himself comes to some churches and removes their lampstands, symbolic of them falling away because of their unfaithfulness to him. Well, I think we tend to to, uh, suppress these stories in Scripture. We don't really like to talk about them. I mean, when we teach the death of Moses, don't we usually emphasize all the glorious things about it? Uh, How he got to peer over into the promised land in his final moments and how he died in a good old age with all his faculties about him. And, and then how Joshua, his successor, turns right around and leads the tribes of Israel into the land of Canaan, conquering it. Now, we like that part. We love the heroic stuff. That stuff is cool. Reality is harder, isn't it? And the, the Bible is nothing if not real. What do we learn from this today? Reality can teach us a lot, even though it can be a harsh slap in the face sometimes. We might, for instance, need a reality check sometimes when it comes to to how we think about the people of God, the church. Preachers, sometimes you're going to feel like a failure. Sometimes you are going to be a failure. But you thought, no one's going to work harder than me. I'm going to preach the the best sermons ever heard. And... I am a faithful prayer warrior, and I defend the truth, and I love the people. Nobody loves the people like me. I think Moses might have said those kind of things or thought those things. How about Jesus? Elders. There are going to be times as a shepherd where you feel like it's all falling apart. Individual lives disintegrating, families breaking up, numbers dropping, and all this despite your best efforts. I mean, don't these sheep know what a great shepherd I am? Ever been there? So is Moses. So is God. Members of the church. Ever feel like you deserve a better church? I mean, look what a good Christian you are. And I don't say that facetiously because you are a good Christian. But look what a good Christian you are. Isn't everyone else supposed to be like that in the church? Aren't we supposed to be a bunch of loving, positive, attractive people who say the right things and behave the right way and all that stuff? Preacher, elder, member, isn't God supposed to give you success in this life? I mean... That's what Joel Osteen says. And he ought to know he has the biggest church in the country down in Houston. So many of them, they have to meet in a basketball arena. And you turn it on later today and and see, it appears that everybody there is as happy and rich and successful as their smiling preacher. How dare God? Let poor Moses go to his grave thinking he was a failure. How dare God let Jesus 
die alone on a cross. How could he allow every church that Paul planted to die out or apostatize within a hundred years of their starting? Doesn't God know about the gospel of success? Has God not listened to all the health and wealth preachers of our day? They'll tell you how it's supposed to be. Well, Paul wrote this. And I quote his words here. He said, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Did you hear what God said through Paul there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? What type of people would make up the people of God? What would the church really be like at times as a result of the kind of people who make up the people of God? At times, foolish Weak, common, poor, low, despised. That's what it was. And that's what it is. And to expect anything else is to either set yourself up for debilitating disappointment or to exchange it all for a false god called success. And to fall completely away. The church is a mess sometimes because it's supposed to be a mess, it's full of messy people. And so, if anything good comes of us, it's because God lifts us up and cleans us up and empowers us to glorify him and to shine a light in this dark world. The world is never going to think we are beautiful or pretty or cutting edge or cool. That's such important truth, it needs to be said twice. The world is never going to think we are beautiful or pretty or cutting edge or cool or any of those things that we are tempted to lust after. And that's okay because we aren't. We, were, we never were. We weren't called to be that. We were called to God. We were called to, to follow after a man who carried a cross of shame and who said to us, I have one for you too. Take up your cross and follow me. Now that is cool. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for loving us despite our flaws and mess-ups. 
Thank you for cleaning us up and calling us into your service. Help us to be faithful, humble servants of yours and, and just to wait on your blessing and to share it with as many as we can. We thank you for the gift of this assembly today. Pray your blessings on each one here and help us to go out now and live in such a way that people will wonder what is going on in that person and ask for the reason for the hope we have. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We come to you in his name today. Amen. As we stand in a moment, if we can serve you in some way through prayer or, or otherwise, through further teaching, we can help you in your response to the to Heavenly Father today. We want to just let us know what that might be as together we stand and sing to encourage.